In chapter three, we're going to talk about continuous functions. A continuous function, by definition, is one such that if whereas x approaches x zero, the limit of f also approaches the value of f at x zero. Put it another way is the delta epsilon definition, which says that given epsilon, the epsilon range, you can choose a delta such that as long as x stays inside delta, y will stay within the epsilon variation of its value. Now, having said that. Let's uh, look at the next theorem. The theorem we're going to study today is the continuous, uh, the, the boundedness of continuous functions on closed intervals. Suppose f is a function that is continuous on a closed finite interval uh, from A to B. Then f is bounded on from A to B on this entire interval. The proof is pretty involved. And in fact, we're going to present two different proofs on this, on this theorem. The first one is uh, based on two principles. First, we'll draw a quick line here. The, the, your interval from A to B, and maybe you have a value x, okay, x0, somewhere in there. And x0 can even be A or B. It can be the endpoint. The principle number one states that, uh, that given x0, you can always choose a delta there exists a delta such that where f is bounded on the interval from uh, from x0 minus delta to x0 plus delta. So there's a very tiny little interval here that has the length of delta that at least f is going to be bounded on that, that little interval. And that is uh, goes directly from the definition of f be, being continuous. Being continuous means you can find a delta such that you can limit the value of f within epsilon of where it's supposed to be, so that f is bounded. The principle number two is that suppose f is bounded on two different intervals. So f is bounded on, on two intervals i1, i2. If that is true, then f is bounded on the in on both of them together. So then f is bounded on i1 union i2. And of course it well that's again fairly intuitive because if if you have a bound on, on here and here, you just pick whatever is the bigger number to bound them both. And if if these two intervals happen to be connecting somehow, then I1 union I2 will be just one big, a bigger interval where F will also be bounded. So those are the, our two principles that we'll, we will use to prove the theorem. The next part is we're going to define a set. Anytime you define a set, it's a more abstract thing to do. It's not as intuitive to sit around and define some kind of a vague collection. But anyway, defining a set is sometimes very helpful in proving uh, improving complex ideas. So let de let's define a set T. The set T is the collection of all elements, I mean all numbers, that's bigger than A and smaller than or equal to B, such that, that F is bounded on, uh, bounded on from, from, uh, let's see, such that f is bounded from a to t on the interval a to t. All right, so, so any t you find right here, and from, from a all the way to t, f has to be bounded on that interval. And if there's such a t, then it will belong to the set t. Now the question, the first thing you always ask yourself when you define a, a set is whether the set is empty. Is there going to be anything in it? How can you show that there's anything in it? So we will prove that the set T is not empty by principle one. Now by principle one, you consider number A, okay? Now F is bounded by principle one, F is bounded by principle one, F is bounded on, on a small interval going from A to A plus delta. This delta is dependent on A. And sometimes the book call it delta of A, but or, or delta subscript A. 
we can do that. So anyway, so A plus a certain delta for going from A to that little bit more is going to be bounded by principle 1, again, because F is continuous. That means any number that's inside T, so if T is, is inside the interval, uh, but doesn't belong to A, so if T is in from A to A plus delta of A, then, then T belongs to T. Okay, because this exists, then we know as a result, this T actually will exist because from A to A plus delta of A, it actually does exist. That is delta A is bigger than zero. So then, so then we know that the set T is not an empty set. So T has members. The next thing is we notice that, that since, T is, since T is less than or equal to B, the set T is bounded from above. That's just by definition. We defined it as T to be all number, numbers that has to be less than B. So because T is not empty and it's bounded from above, it has a T has least upper bound. Uh, we will just call it LUB. To say ready, T has least upper bound. And we will call the least upper bound C. Now, in the next part of this video, we will show the first thing is that C belongs to T. I mean, just because C is the least upper bound, sometimes it doesn't mean it has to belong there. But in this case, C does indeed belong to it. So first thing we'll show is that C belongs to T, <coughs> which is another way of saying that F is bounded going from A to C. And the second thing we will show is that C equals to B which will conclude our proof because that goes that shows that f is bounded going from a to b so we'll go to the next video